Hi. How's it going? Uh, my name is George. That's my next slide. Uh, I'm very chill. You'll notice that because all of my slides are in lowercase. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to have a fun time. It's going to be good. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Framer, for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to be talking to you all today. Um, I've been in the Framer community for a while, and I've actually been designing for my whole life. Um, this is me doing my first design system. Uh, <laughs> I was a project for Crayola. I was the youngest employee ever to be there. And no, I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, I didn't always want to be a designer, but I knew that I always wanted to make things. I really love making things. Um, and then I ended up studying advertising in school. I worked in advertising for a bit. I realized that it really wasn't for me. Um, and then I made my transition to screens. Um, I am one of the uh, people that was blessed by Tim Van Dam out there that he mentioned earlier. Um, I met Tim at South by Southwest, and he introduced me to all of his friends, and then now I'm at Instagram. Um, and I've been at Facebook for about five years, I've been at Instagram for about a year, and I'm currently working on the creation team. And so what that entails is, you know, kind of everything um, Instagram stories related from like your camera to where you share. Um, and this has been a lot of fun. It's very interactive work, which I really like. And most recently, I've been working on our camera effects platform, which is basically lets anybody, like any of you could do this. There's a tool called Spark, and you can make your own camera effects and publish them to Instagram that other people can use. Um, I've gotten to make a few of them uh, while working on this project. Apparently, my niche is like weird internet stuff uh, that is very retro. Um, and this has been such a fun project to work on because it's so it's such an interesting experience to kind of create half of the puzzle and then give the other half to the community and let's see what they do with it. Um, so it's been a lot of fun and literally like two days ago we launched um, this effects gallery, which is really cool. It lets you sort of browse all the different camera effects people have published to Instagram um, and you can find ones that are cool and try them on and use them in your own story. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, today I'm excited to talk to you all about quality. Uh, and quality for me has become the thing that I start to care the most about because you, you know, you can make really cool prototypes, you can make really cool mock-ups, but at the end of the day, all that really matters is like, what's the quality of the experience that people are getting when they use what you make? Um, and so I looked up the definition of quality to do this talk. It's such a bad def like it's so vague. It doesn't really tell you much. It's, what does it say? The standard of something as measured against other things of a similar kind. What? That doesn't, that's not really help. I mean, I guess that, that just defines quality, but it's not super helpful. Um, when I think about quality, something that comes to mind is this feeling of being able to screenshot your app and post about it rather than like posting your mockups because you know that the, what actually shipped isn't quite what you wanted and you're not super proud of it. Um, and that moment of being able to just like tweet the thing that you made just by screenshotting in it and not having to hide through your mockups, um, to me is like kind of the pinnacle of quality. Um, quick question, everybody raise their hands, it's the end of the day, I know, let's stretch, let's move our arms, everybody hands up, hands up, everybody, there we go. Now, not all hands, just one hand's fine. <laughs> uh, put your hand down if you always are stoked with how things come out, that you don't have any trouble with quality, you're kind of confused about why we're even talking about this, and you're like, I don't have any issues. There's a lot of hands still up, uh, if you can see. Uh, and this kind of maps, I did a very scientific Twitter poll um, before the talk, and this is crazy to me that like 55% of people in my very scientific poll are like rarely or never satisfied with the things that they make. Um, and so I thought that this might be a good thing to talk about and to try and figure out. Um, but the reality is that quality is elusive. It's something that we struggle to find. It's something that we struggle to really hang on to. Um, and our goal today is to hopefully figure out why that is uh, and maybe we can get a little bit closer to it. So really, what is quality? Like we, I think we should all have some sort of like shared definition to work off of so that we can talk about it together. Um, so let's like unpack this and let's figure out uh, what makes up quality. Uh, and I've done a lot of quality thinking in preparing for this talk, and I think that quality can be broken apart into three components. We have form, function, and feeling. And right in the center there where all those three overlap, that's the sweet spot where quality lives. Uh, and when we make work, you know, sometimes it's all to spec, but it's kind of slow and it doesn't have the animations you wanted. Sometimes it works great, but it looks like shit. 
Uh, sometimes, you know, you convince someone to do that animation you really like, but everything else is kind of wrong. And we kind of bounce around and around and around, and we never sort of hit that middle. Why is this so hard? What are we missing? Um, let's sort of take quality one piece at a time and see if we can't figure out where the gap is. Uh, so let's start with form. I think form is the easiest thing to talk about to a room full of designers um, because it's what we talk about all day and it's what we do all day. Um, and so, okay, if it's form's fault, then it's my fault, right? I'm a bad designer. I messed up. I'm an imposter. I should have made more specs. I should have made more things. And if only I had made more stuff or I made something better, it would have come out as a better quality product. Uh, and I don't think that that's it. Like, there's no shortage of beautiful things on the front page of Dribbble. And if it was that easy to make a quality experience, then we would have way more quality experiences in the world. Um, this alone isn't enough for quality. And when you start to think about the different parts of quality, and if form is the thing that designers are responsible for, then who's responsible for the rest of it? Uh, and I think that it's actually falls on the rest of your team. So your engineer is really who gates the functional quality of your product, right? Your PM is who is really in control of like the feeling part of your product. And we'll get into these a little more in a minute, but that's just kind of where I think the breakdown is. So this is great, right? Because it's the, other it's the other part of the team's fault. It's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault. I know that I'm like an amazing designer and that I couldn't do anything wrong. Uh, so it must be the rest of my team is bad and they suck. My PM cares too much about growth. My engineers don't know how to do animations. Like, it's not my fault, it's their fault. Um, and I just stop you right there. I think that this is a very like, toxic line of thinking, but it's an easy trap to fall into, right? It's really easy to point fingers at other people and pl place the blame otherwhere, other places. The reality is that everyone is on the same team, right? Everyone that you work with works where you work for the same reason that you do, right? They want to make really cool stuff. They want to make the product that you have better. If you feel like this isn't true, then like, maybe you should get a different job, but hopefully, right, everyone on your team is like also believing that the product can be good. Um, so I think it's just important to assume good intent when you're thinking about the rest of your team. So okay, if it's not my design skills and it's not the rest of my team, then I just need to control all these other pieces, right? We should just put design in control of everything and I need to like collect my infinity stones of quality and wield my quality gauntlet and just like make everything better. So let's do that, okay? Let's like start to control the other parts of quality. Um, so we'll move on to function. Uh, and this one's easy, right? Obviously, designers should code, right? That, then we'd have control over the functional part of quality. Um, people keep saying this on Twitter. It must be what I'm missing. Uh, so let's just, we'll do that. We'll, we'll start doing that. So let me pop open Xcode. Uh, and I'm going to start fixing this janky app. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend all week on this because I don't really know what I'm doing. But, you know, I'm going to fix the padding on this button that's driving me crazy. And it's going to take me all week, but it doesn't matter because quality, right? It's going to make the quality better and I can just do this for forever. Um, I think that this is also not quite sustainable. Um, a lot of, I, like, I would just want to make things, right? I don't want to get bogged down in like having to fix all these things. And I don't think that that's what people mean when they say designers should code. I think it's really quick to jump to this thought of like, oh, everyone should, every designer should get a degree in computer science, right? That's not, I think, what designers should code mean. Um, why should designers code? Uh, why do we keep hearing this over and over and over again uh, in the narrative around design? Um, who's ever had a conversation like this? Uh, your engineer just got the latest mock that you did. He really likes it, but it's just going to be too hard to build. It's going to take too long, and you need to just do something else. This is sort of the trap that uh, people fall into because they don't know how to communicate with engineers well. Uh, and I think that that's really what Designer Should Code is about, is it's about starting to learn how to think logically, starting to understand how the products you're working on work. You're understanding your medium more. What are the materials? How do these things fit together? What are the constraints? And you're, you're basically gaining empathy for your engineers, right? These people, these are the people that are creating the things that you've designed. Um, and it's hard work. Uh, and so by learning to code, by like having some experience doing that, uh, I think you'll collaborate better with your engineers. Designer's superpower, I feel like, is connecting the dots between different things. And even just having a little bit of understanding of code, we'll take that conversation that we just had and maybe turn it into something like this. 
uh, where instead I can collaborate with my engineer and push them and together we can think of a different solution that on our own neither of us would have thought about before. And just like that, we've moved our little dot a little closer to the center. We did it. Hooray. It's mission accomplished. Um, but wait, we didn't, we didn't really do anything, right? We didn't change anything about what we actually do. Maybe the path to quality is not through like complete dominant control. We, we moved this dot not by stealing control, but by communicating and connecting with our engineers and understanding them. And I think this is what we're missing. I think there's a lot of feeling of designers that you need to like go and craft this perfect, precious thing and bring it out and present it to your team. And it's just like, I solved the problem. I did it. I did it all on my own. I think we need to pop the bubble and let people in and communicate get people in on the process early and connect with people and really like understand the people that you're working with, right? So rather than looking at you know, this person as a software engineer that just makes the thing that I designed, uh, this is actually Carla and she has a life and she has different motivations and she has things that she's thinking about and cares about. And sometimes those things align, right? Sometimes both of us care a lot about quality and these things match up and these are the engineers that we like traditionally love to work with because they just kind of get it but maybe Carla's goal is to like learn more about product strategy um, and what can happen is that even if you don't realize it you're both trying to do different things and no one's prioritizing the other person's needs um, so instead of doing this I, knowing that now, because I've connected with Carla, could make some room for her in my process, right? I could include her in some brainstorms or whiteboard with her or basically make her feel like she's being supported by her team. And then when I go and bug her to like fix the padding on a button or like do this animation, she's going to feel like, oh, well, you know, we care about each other and we support each other. So I'll, I'm going to make some time to do this rather than just like pushing it off because it sounds hard. So um, I think it's important to let people in um, and to communicate with people and to connect with them. And honestly, this is something that's been hard for me. Uh, I have struggled with this for a while. And it really honestly didn't occur to me until my beautiful fiance told me uh, about her experiences uh, in her job. And this is a natural skill of hers. Uh, she's really good at this. And uh, it kind of opened my eyes to how important these things are um, and how much of a difference it can make. Um, so I think relationships are kind of one of the things that make quality possible. So okay, we've got function figured out. Let's move on to feeling. Um, feeling's tricky because it's hard to talk about feelings, right? Everyone's got different feelings, everyone feels different feelings, and it's just like a complicated topic to even get into. I think that the feeling component of quality is really made up of like these three things when we're solving real problems for people, not problems that we've made up, when we're anticipating what are the people using our product need, and when we're intentionally designing for them. When you have a nice mixture of those things, you start to create a really good feeling in your product. And what do these things have in common? Well, they take time, right? Good design takes time. Good design is hard. You need time to research. You need time to try things. You need time to experiment. You need time to fail. And you also need time to implement these things. Um, and this is why I think PMs are sort of the keepers of feeling. Because from their perspective, like, we don't have time for this. We need to get stuff out the door. And so again, thinking about our product managers, right? We usually have a tough relationship with product, product managers. Uh, they make us go to a lot of meetings. They want everything yesterday. They kind of just don't get it. Um, but again, this is like a real person. This is Sam who you know, really wants to make something good, but just is under a lot of pressure to get stuff done. Uh, and I think that when it comes to how PMs and designers differ, for a PM, their top priority is time, right? They need to make sure things are getting done, the right things are getting done, and the product's moving forward. Obviously, they care about people too, but not at the expense of time, because to them, time is the most important thing. Designers, on the other hand, obviously care about people first, and we don't care how long it takes, right? We'll work months on some tiny little thing, um, just getting it just right, and it's okay that it takes time. Um, and so I think the way to sort of address this gap when it comes to feeling uh, is by creating alignment. Uh, between you and your PM, and that comes through things like principles, communicating, and compromise. Here's another conversation example. Um, what if we made this button blink? Think about how many people would tap on this button if we made this button blink. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard a similar sort of conversation, and those are really hard to push back on, right? Because 
you know as a designer that this is wrong and you try to articulate it, but it just comes off like designer bullshit, like you just made up a bunch of stuff and it's like, we can't because reasons. Um, and this is where principles really come in, make a big difference. Um, sit down with your team and come up with principles on what's important to you and what's important to your product. Um, for example, some of our Instagram design principles are do the simple thing first. And for me, this was a big one because it really forces you to sort of backtrack and understand like what's the simplest solution here and not overcomplicate the product. Um, there's a lot of bad ideas out in the world, right? Uh, and principles sort of protect us from those bad ideas and they create some sort of filter to keep the bad ideas from getting through um, and it gives us a stable place to build quality on top of those. So maybe next time this conversation might go a little differently and that is a lot stronger of a pushback than, mm, I don't know, reasons. Um, so having principles is gonna get that dot just a little bit closer to the center. We still need good ideas, right? We still need to make sure we're solving a real problem, that we're doing these things intentionally. Um, and so I don't think this alone is enough. I think that we need some really good ideas in between there. Um, and really good ideas are easy for a PM to latch onto because they make sense and they're clear and they ladder up to the things that are important to them. Great ideas really need clear communication. And so another quick question, everybody hands back up again. Just one hand this time, not both hands, okay. How many of you feel like you're incredible communicators and you can get buy-in from anyone on anything and this is like, pff, slam dunk, I can like sell anybody anything? A lot of you, are you putting your hand down because you think that that's true? Leave your hands up if that's true, or false, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, this sort of maps to another very scientific Twitter poll that I did. Um, where lots of people feel like they're just okay. Like, I think that you could probably be a better communicator um, and that will help get those great ideas through. So real quick, let's do a crash course in design communication um, to help you sort of address this feeling part of quality. So these are things that I think are really important when you're talking about design at your company. One, you need to start with a problem, right? We can't just do things because it makes it look nicer or because it feels good or because it's fun to like make cool animations. Try to like ground everything in an actual problem because when you, when you uh, talk about these, these ideas with other people in your company, they're gonna latch onto that better than some designery stuff that doesn't kind of make sense. How are you framing your problem? This is really key. Um, a lot of times you can sort of just jump in the deep end your first slide in a meeting and really get off running and a lot of times there's people in the room that have varying levels of context. So always start from a place of zero and build the room up together. Don't just assume that the other people in the room automatically know exactly what you're talking about. Be sure to scope your feedback. Be really clear on what you're looking for feedback on. If the illustrations aren't final, be really upfront that we do not want this kind of feedback. If you're looking for feedback more around structure and not around visuals, say that. Be really clear with the kind of feedback you're looking for, and this prevents your meetings from really going off the rails, um, people like getting too deep on stuff that doesn't matter. It's so important to tell and show. Uh, I fall in this trap myself where to me the solution feels really obvious and it feels really clear and so I just talk about it expecting other people to see it as clearly as me and the reality is that if I had actually prototyped that idea sooner and given something given them something to see rather than just hear it would save a lot of meetings because then everyone can react to the same thing we're not reacting to the pictures in our brain we're reacting to what you're seeing on the screen um, so that is super important bring everyone on the journey this kind of goes back to the Lion King thing of like you know, don't just show up with a solution and be like, this is it, bye, good luck, here, I figured it out, it's perfect. Um, when you bring people along on your journey and you bring people along on your thought process and you all arrive at the conclusion together, then you're all already aligned. There's no alignment to do because everyone was a part of the process. Um, and the last thing I think that's important is that your work is not you. And again, this is something I struggle a lot with, is feeling like when people are critiquing my work, they're critiquing me, and I get defensive, and I feel like they don't like me because they don't like this thing that I did. And it's, it's sort of hard to tease that apart, and it's something that I'm still working on. Um, but I think it's really important to know that like, someone cannot like something you made and still like you as a person. Um, and so when we have these principles, when we communicate clearly with our PMs, um, and they understand why these things are important, why quality is important, then we can finally move that dot right into the center. So to recap, form, 
This is what we all already do. We're already probably pretty good at this. Um, and if you're not good at it, that's okay, but getting better is like a solo journey. So don't focus all your energy here when you're trying to make quality better at your company. Um, function, obviously, learn to code. Um, but you know, connect with your engineers. Really like, understand them as people, understand what motivates them, understand why they come to work every day. Um, and I think you'll have a much better job getting uh, quality built into your product. And for feeling, feeling honestly takes time. This is the sort of thing where you need to like build up that equity over and over again through consistent, clear communication. And then people will start to trust you and things will just sort of happen on their own. And those all together give you some quality. Thanks.